Committee meetings. Robert, Mr. Brown, you're up. Ms. Whitworth. How are you doing? Hey, members of the board, Commissioner. I am doing fabulous. Hope y'all are doing fabulous today. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I am here today to present the amended 23, the House version thus far. Um, I believe it's going to be taken up by the Senate later on this week. I believe this week. And I'm here to present um, the Governor's 24 budget request. I went over both of these last month, but I'll go over 24. It's kind of like in a highlight since nothing's really changed on 24 yet but we'll start with the house version their changes so in the 23 uh, recommendation for the house there you'll I, i'm doing the summary sheet here like i typically do on the revenue there is an 89 million increase in excise mostly that's primarily due to the interest income um, you'll see no changes in the transportation trust fund um, the transportation trust fund is compiled of the hotel motel fee, um, heavy vehicle fee, and the um, alternative fuel vehicle fee. You'll see Greta, Georgia Regional Transportation Authority, being moved into our budget from DCA. Then you'll see the transit trust fund, or better known as the ride share fees. Um, there's no change to it. And then in state general funds, you'll see an add of $12.3 million that's been put in by the House. Here is the breakdown of the bar graph that I do. You can see roughly 48% of the overall budget is made up of the capital projects, which consists of capital construction, capital maintenance, and local roads admin. Um, in the operational piece, it consists of roughly 12% of the overall budget. That is the administrative aspect of it with program delivery, data collections, planning, traffic management, everything to get the projects ready to be delivered and thus far. Um, LAMIG, you'll see LAMIG at 209 and that's the 10% of the excise. Um, you'll see in routine maintenance makes up 21% of the overall budget. That's the second largest program. Um, next is payments to CERTA, which makes up roughly around 2%. That is primarily our GRB and Garvey debt service. Um, the Georgia Transportation Infrastructure Bank, and now it's made up of Greta. Um, and next is the intermodal that has been collapsed back down into one program, which consists of airport aid, transit, rail, ports, and waterways. And then you'll see the geo bond debt service makes up roughly 5%, and then payments to the ATL makes up a little bit less than 1%. Okay, moving into the breakdown, you'll see here I've got the programs and I've got the fund sources. We've talked a lot about this the last couple of months. You can see in the geo bond debt service, there's an increase of roughly $3.7 million. Up in the motor fuel portion of this, there was a fund source swap between fees and motor fuel. So, and those fees were redirected down into the capital construction program, as you can see below. And then you can also see that there's a slight increase in the variable rate geo bond debt service for motor fuel. Um, so the total of, to, of the geo bond debt service is $112.4 million. Down in capital construction, as you can see the fund source swap I was referring to and the overall net effect of that is the $51.4 million add. What this does, it gives us the ability to do additional projects and handle those cost increases you've heard the commissioner present to you in the last several months like in June and July you, you saw a lot of those in his presentation that he did on the cost escalations and for commodities in routine maintenance budget you'll see an add of 25 million dollars what this does it helps us cover the high cost of the material cost and the inflationary cost and the fuel like when the uh, commissioner went to the joint appropriations here and one of his slides talked about the increased cost, um, which I thought was very um, good information and the fact that like it showed that our maintenance contracts have increased by 70%. Um, our mowing contracts have increased by 29% overall. 
Pavement markings are up 21, and the sweeping, guardrail, herbicide, those range in the mid 35% all the way up to 38% increases. So that you can see where the cost of the commodities and due to the inflationary cost, what's going on there in the routine maintenance program. Um, in Lameg, you'll see the additional add of the $8.9 million to true up excise. And then in payments to CERTA, what that is, is Greta being brought in from DCA's budget into the payments to CERTA program. Mm -hmm. All right, in the next slide here, you can see the breakout of airport aid, rail, and transit. In the airport aid program, the House um, did an ad of $7.8 million, roughly, uh, in, into airport aid. Um, our overall request in airport aid is roughly $298 million, which we have close to $75 million in eligible costs, um, state eligible costs that can be utilized in that program. That with the $34 million, we're able to leverage roughly 46 to 47% of that list. Um, in the rail programs, you'll see an additional $3 million. This is a continuation of the trying to get those uh, tr the rail lines up to Class 2 standards, which is the $285,000 pound in, in traveling 25 miles per hour. Of the 442 um, lines that we have, we've been able to address 330 of them. We have roughly 112 miles left to go, so this will help go towards those efforts. And then in transit at the bottom, you'll see an ad in state general funds of $1.4 million. What this is, is the in the federal portal last year at year end was not up and operational at the time our state year end close went into effect. So we do those um, FTA grants for the subrecipient grants. We roughly have 125 subrecipients that we do FTA grants for every year. What this does is gives us the ability to do the match for those grants that got delayed due to the federal portal being closed. Mm -hmm. So this will help us put us back in line. And that is the ads from the House for the 23. Is there any questions on the amended 23 before I move into the highlights of the 24? Okay. No questions. Okay, what I'm going to do here is I'll go through the highlights since there's been no changes. Just a little refresher here today. There was a $119 million add to excise. This was based off the revenue estimate the state economists did. The transportation trust fund and the transit trust fund ride share fees. You can see both there's an add of $51.3 million and an add of the $7.6. What this is, they're adjusted based off the FY22 collection. So what was um, what was actually collected in 22 gets appropriated in 24, and this is the cleanup of, of those collections, showing those appropriated. And then in state general funds, you'll see a reduction of the $919,000. Those are within the rail and the ports program, and I'll highlight that here in a second. Um, here is the bar graph that I previously talked to. You can kind of see still a lot, the capital program went up roughly a few percentages. It's actually close to 50% now of the overall budget. Routine maintenance has stayed in line as well as the other programs. So I will just, uh, you know, those are some of the major highlights is the capital program being increased. Moving into, I guess, the meats and potatoes of all this, the, in the geo bond debt service, you'll see the increase of the $438,000. That's primarily the sun source swap between the fees, same thing that happened in 23, and it's really truing up the debt service due to those variable rate debt. In um, capital construction, there's an ad of $128 million after the fund source swap. I mean, $114 million after the fund source swap of the 128 mm -hmm. that you see there in transportation trust fund fees being added. Um, what that does, it helps us with purely the increased cost that we're seeing in all of the commodities, as well as the increased match that we're um, encountering due to the IIJA bill. So that can help in either any of those areas. In the capital maintenance programs, there's an additional $8.7 million being added. 
this basically helps us offset those, those cost increases in the commodities for resurfacing that we're seeing. Um, in program delivery, the $2.7 million consists of the statewide changes that, we're, that we see in 24's budget. We're greatly appreciative of the governor's recommendation for the $2,000 pay raise for state employees. They have a slight change in the DOAS insurance um, across uh, a lot of the programs that you'll see here that make up these statewide changes. So that's what makes up the program delivery change. And then on the next slide here, you'll see data collection, that $37,000 ad, is strictly the adjustment for the $2,000 COLA that the governor's recommending, as well as the DOAS insurance adjustment. Um, in departmental admin, the ad of the $4.9 million, it can consist of some operational needs within the program as well as the COLA adjustment and the DOAS insurance adjustment as well as a um, uh, Teamworks billing is in there. So part of all of that is included in part of the statewide adjustments and the departmental admin. In LMEG, what the $11.9 million, $11 million does, it gives you the 10% of excise. So that's the increase you see there to be 10% of the proposed excise for 24. There's no change in local roads admin. Um, in planning, what you see here is the $2,000 COLA adjustment and the statewide changes. Um, in the routine maintenance program, the $25.6 million. You see all the you see the two thousand dollar cola and the statewide adjustments, but you see a nineteen point five million dollar adjustment as well to offset offset the con the increase in contracting and fuel costs that the that the the program is seeing currently. And then in traffic management, it's just the six hundred thirty nine thousand addresses those statewide changes. All right, moving into the intermodal program. You'll see airport aid. Um, in the airport aid program, there was no change recommended. The $26 million still does leverage roughly $46.5 million in matching funds for FAA. Um, in ports and waterways, that $7,337 adjustment is for the statewide changes and the COLA adjustment. Um, in rail, what you see in here in rail is the $8 million was the one-time funding of the uh, ad that was made last session for the class two standards upgrade. That was the one time adjustment. They're taking it out of 24 in the base. Um, and then you see, a, this is a new line item, the locomotive diesel funds of 7 million, and split, like $7.07 .07 million. What this is, it is the locomotive tax that was imposed. Um, what this is, it, it's Basically, it's distributed off a formula based off the number of miles the rail lines have. So it's not a it's not a seven million dollars that can be distributed anywhere in the program. It's a seven million dollars that is based off a formula that is distributed based off the mileage. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And then within that program, they also made some statewide changes um, as well um, in that program. In the transit program, you see there's an increase of $5 million in the transportation trust fund fees. Um, what that is, that is the transit match that I talked about earlier in 23, where they added in the house the funding to match those FTA grants for those subrecipients, which we have roughly 125 of those statewide. That's what that funding is. And then in the transit trust fund, the $7.6 million that is based off a formula distribution statewide that is established. Then on our last slide here is in payments to CERTA. You see the transportation trust fund, there's a reduction there. What that is, is there's a reduction in their guaranteed revenue bond debt service. And then it's recognizing Greta coming into their base budget for their program. And then finally, in payments to the ATL, the $66,000 is to, um, to true up the $2,000 the $2, COLA adjustment by the governor and their DOS insurance adjustment. And that is the, that's the highlights of the 24 governor's recommendation. Mm -hmm. We have met um, with the House on 24, but, with, but there, 
we've met with the House, but we'll see how the movement goes on that. Any questions? Yes, Mr. Lewis. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Just real quick, the, the locomotive diesel tax or fee is, and I think you mentioned this at one time before, but does that help fund the improvements to the Class B railroads or, or, or however you referenced that earlier? I think Russell's going to yeah. comment on this. Russell's done a lot of talking about this in the last week in our hearings <laughs> on the local. No, because a lot of that is getting confusing my memory. And it's complicated. So uh, Angela did a good job laying that out. So this is the first time we've received the, these appropriations, and it's from the sales tax on the diesel locomotives on the rail. And so this appropriation uh, is uh, 7.073 is based on 2022 collections. So it's a look back and there's going to be this lag. So we actually think this number goes down in the future because of the suspension. Uh, so uh, it was ultimately suspended for a little bit of time as well as one of the, in the executive order. Uh, so, but the use of this, and Angela sort of talked about the use, mm -hmm. is by state law, uh, it has to be appropriated, um, or excuse me, it has to be used with regard to the operating miles of each railroad. So that applies to class one, like Norfolk Southern and CSX. It also applies to the short line operators public and private because it is is to all operators that are operating with operating miles in Georgia. So uh, this is new. So we, uh, as been presented, I'm, I, the months escaped me, but a few months ago we talked about, or probably certainly last year, calendar year, we talked about the Georgia State Rail Freight Program, which is different than this. Uh, there, this is a, a carve-out in law and in, in, uh, Code 48, I believe it is. So We've got to sort of meld these two things together, uh, which is sort of good news. Is it's, it gives the ability to work with the uh, other uh, railroads uh, outside of state-owned short lines. So, uh, so that's what it is. I don't know if that answers the question, but it is it's certainly new. Uh, it's again the use of it has to be in regards, or the the deployment of these dollars have to be in regards to the operating miles of each railroad. No, thank you for that answer, and it does help, but it, it brings up another question that I have. In, since this is new, and in light of the disaster that happened up in Ohio a week or so ago, does this increase any liability to the state as it may relate to a, a tragedy like that if, if such were to occur in Georgia? I would need legal counsel to help with that answer. <laughs> it's a fair question. Um, a very fair question. I don't know that to be the case and anything we would contract for, we would look for indemnify, indemnify the state. So pretty much in most of our contracts, we look for that indemnification. So we would certainly seek for that. Whether there's something, yeah, let's hope nothing like that happens. But when things like that happen, usually everybody gets sued regardless and then you have to work it out. It's a good point though, thank you. I have any further questions. Mr. Brown, I might, I might might add on the payments to CERTA in both both years. Just a reminder that uh, right at thirteen million dollars, uh, CERTA deploys for the Georgia Transportation Infrastructure Bank, which is a very popular program. Mm -hmm. And so, where they do uh, grants, which are most popular, but also loans. And we've had several county governments uh, over the past few years apply to CERTA for loans uh, to get basically the state's interest rate on loans and to deploy other projects such as resurfacing and and do they, they can make a they can take a, a t-splost or splost dollars and get a loan up front and go pay a whole lot more when costs are lower than waiting and deferring and having to pay it over time so it's a it's certainly a good program i just wanted to, to mention that and the the balance of those dollars in that budget is paying our federal debt service that sort of holds for us so as angela talked about geo bond debt service that's one and the other is the federal debt, uh, which is good as you saw that, that those numbers are coming down. This, uh, they're not variable rate, but just wanted to mention that. It's a good program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Whitworth. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Brown's on deck today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mr. 
Wilson. Good, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, right. members of the committee, and Commissioner McMurray. Um, awesome. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, come to you and present uh, to the Intermodal Committee today and provide an update on the 2050 Georgia Rural and Human Services Transportation Plan. This is a unique study. Uh, it is a study that goes beyond GDOT and includes our partners at the Department of Human Services and the Department of Community Health. Georgia is the only state that provides RHST services across three state agencies, and this requires careful coordination. As I mentioned, this is a tri-agency plan in partnership with uh, DHS and DCH. I'd like to recognize uh, Cheryl Harrington from DCH, who is the Deputy Director of Transportation, and Kimberly McKnight from DCH, um, who is the Non-Emergency Medical Transportation Manager. Uh, they're joining us via the webcast on behalf of those agencies, and I, I truly appreciate their time and effort uh, in this process. I would also like to note that this is the first time all three agencies have partnered on a statewide plan. And I'd also like to recognize um, our consultant team led by Monrobility Partners uh, and supported by Cambridge Systematics and ACOM. Uh, the focus um, uh, this afternoon will be providing you all with an overview of RHST services in Georgia, our plan process, our draft recommendations, and our next steps. The state of Georgia administers three systems to provide public transit, human services transportation, and non-emergency medical transportation. Each system is administered by a different state agency using different funding sources. GDOT focuses on public transit for rural and small urban populations. DHS focuses on transportation services for seniors, low-income families, individuals with disabilities, and vocational training, while DCH focuses on transportation to medically necessary services for eligible Medicaid members. Coordination exists at the state, regional, and local levels. However, each agency's system operates independently using a variety of service delivery models with differing requirements. The state's role in governing transit is primarily to oversee compliance with federal grant requirements. There's no single state authority to set priorities for public transit and human services transportation or to coordinate planning and funding of transit services for rural communities. This is why this plan is so critical. Let's rip the next page here for me. I noted that this was the first time all three agencies have partnered on a statewide plan. This is true, but back um, in 2007, GDOT and DHS partnered to complete the first coordinated public transit human services transportation plan. This set up initial coordination recommendations between the agencies. In 2011, this plan was updated and retitled to the Georgia Rural and Human Service Transportation Plan 2.0. This plan initiated a technical coordinating group consisting of GDOT, DHS, and statewide stakeholders, and the plan inclu included recommendations for improved service delivery for the state's public transportation and human services transportation customers, and implementation of a mobility management program at the state and regional level. It's not noted on the slide, but I'd like to call out that in 2020, uh, GDOT completed our first statewide transit plan. Uh, this plan touched on RHSD services in Georgia. After the statewide transit plan in 2021, GDOT, DHS, and now DCH began developing an update to the plan called the 2050 Georgia RHSD plan. This plan focuses on providing a framework for additional coordination at geographic and administrative levels and expanding our technical advisory group to additional statewide stakeholders. At the beginning of this plan, we established the vision and goals with our technical advisory group, which I will discuss on the next slide. We developed six goals for this plan, and I'd like to note they are in line with the goals from the statewide transit plan. The overall vision is to continue and grow statewide rural and human services transportation coordination to improve the quality of life and economic activities for all Georgians, specifically those in rural areas, those with disabilities, older adults, and persons without vehicles. Our goals focus on coordination, safety, system optimization, access, connectivity, and technology. I mentioned our technical advisory group this group was established at the beginning of the plan process. The group is made up of several statewide representatives, including transportation providers, human service agencies, and other services that are impacted by transportation. There are four key functions of this group. The first is to provide feedback during our meetings, uh, review documents, share information within their networks, and encourage participation in outreach efforts. 
we depend on them for their knowledge and to help get the word out regarding uh, this plan. They will also be critical in any successful implementation of the plan's recommendations. I'd like to highlight these organizations in the boxes. They are critical partners who serve populations in the state that generally are not included in other transit or transportation planning activities. They represent key demographics that utilize RHSD services in the state and their voices are really critical to this plan's success. Once we developed our vision and goals, we need to understand where in Georgia there are gaps in rural transit services and completed an existing conditions and needs assessment. The graph highlights two key observations. The first is it shows the low to high unmet rural transit trip demand by regional commission. We found that Georgia has a need for expansion across the state, but those most rural areas of our state see the highest needs. Those in Northwest Georgia, the Georgia mountains, Three Rivers, Heart of Georgia, Northeast Georgia, and Southern Georgia. <clears throat> Turning now to our outreach efforts, in January last year, we conducted two online surveys. One targeted to the transportation providers uh, that operate rural public transit and human service transportation and NEMT services, and the other to the riders of these services to gather information about the challenges for the providers and the rider experience. We then categorized the responses into three buckets, administrative, rider demand and satisfaction, and funding. Taking a closer look at, at rider demand and satisfaction, we note that there are issues around the level of service, such as declining ridership and not being able to transport riders outside of their jurisdiction. The amenities on these vehicles could also be improved, such as providing real-time information. And looking at the perception of transit, we note that it is not reliable for certain timely trips. We also conducted 12 regional workshops that were open to the public that were advertised on the project website and through social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Social media posts were developed and posted through GDOT Communications and distributed to our TAG members, asking them to post and share within their networks. Uh, the recordings and the presentations from these workshops uh, were posted on the project website for additional viewing. During these workshops, we asked the participants a series of questions using virtual polling and encouraging open-ended discussion. From that feedback, we categorized the comments we received into rider demand and satisfaction, compliance, marketing, funding, staffing, and coordination. I'll highlight the five comments we repeatedly heard across the regions. The first is more flexibility in service, whether this is creating flex routes, ability to travel outside of the jurisdiction, or introducing a mobility on demand model like microtransit, where rides can be booked and made on the same day. The second is a desire to increase uh, the operating hours and days of transit. However, the biggest constraint to that is number three, which is the driver shortage and the lack of funding to pay competitive wages. And number four is the need for more or newer vehicles, especially ones with wheelchair lifts. And finally, for those regions that have a single county rural transit operator, what we call a, a non-coordinated system. We heard a lot of interest in starting a coordinated system, allowing public transit to provide non-emergency medical transportation and provide intra and intra-regional trips. Based on the input we received from the needs assessment, the surveys, the technical advisory group, and the regional workshops, we identified nine key RHST needs. These include administrative and planning, technology in administration and operations, marketing to increase awareness, diversified funding sources, community partnerships to expand service and funding, regional and multi-county transit, service flexibility and uh, responsiveness, expanding workforce transportation, and finally customer amenities on board and at stops. With all the comments and the nine key needs we heard from the surveys, regional workshops, and the TAG, GDOT, DHS, and DCH rolled up our sleeves for an all-day workshop where we identified 86 recommendations to address those needs. We were able to further synthesize and organize these 86 recommendations into 14 categories. And under each of these categories, we subdivide the recommendations into either a project, a program, or a policy. We then took each of these 86 recommendations and put them through an evaluation to determine how well each one aligns with the six goals of the plan. This slide shows an example of that evaluation process where we start with the goals and objectives, 
we created an evaluation category for the goal and then an evaluation measure question. We assigned an answer. Here it's high, medium, and low, and a score is assigned to each answer. Those recommendations with higher scores indicate better alignment with the goals and lower scores indicate less aligned. I noted that we had 86 recommendations. Uh, we don't have time to review all of them today, but I will highlight the top five that were most closely aligned with the plan goals. These include creating more connections from rural areas to activity centers. What type of service this is really will uh, depend on the local regional characteristics um, and different service types, such as commuter bus versus a local transit option that might be more applicable. Expanding capacity of rural systems. Uh, this gets to the need for transit that I showed earlier. Uh, providing flexible services, such as microtransit. Uh, connecting rural areas with high areas of development, which may be different than an activity center and may be focused on a cluster of jobs. And finally, leveraging intercity and long distance transportation services, which includes coordination with intercity bus operators and expanding regional transit operations. So once we had the alignment results, we had to think about implementation. Primarily, who is responsible for each recommendation and how quickly can each recommendation be implemented? The recommendations were broken into four categories. At the top, you have the recommendations that are the state's responsibility, either GDOT, DHS, or DCH, or our state agency tag members, and then can they be implemented within five years or will they likely take longer than five years to implement? Some of the larger, more expensive projects fall into this category. At the bottom, the categories are similar, except you have recommendations that would be the responsibility of a local government or regional commission. This is critical because GDOT, DHS, and DCH cannot implement all of the recommendations on our own. We need the support of our other state agencies, regional and local agencies, and nonprofit organizations. As an example, here are the short-term state recommendations that would fall under GDOT purview and then what I, as the mobility manager, would be responsible for working on over the next couple of years. These include focusing on creating more guidance and best practices for our providers and operators, working to expand our Let's Ride rural transit mobile application, and then uh, some projects like developing a statewide one call information number and website with transit and provider information. This also includes coordinating within GDOT. Uh, for example, regarding guidance on fleet electrification, the GDOT planning division recently developed the state's NEVI plan, and um, so fleet electrification can build off that plan. And we also can coordinate with the ATL link regarding their bus electrification plan. Wrapping up, uh, the final report is currently under review, and we plan to finish reviews and revisions by the end of the month. Uh, we'll hold public comment period um, on the final report in March, and then we'll finalize the plan in April. Uh, again, I appreciate your time this afternoon um, and invite you to please visit the project website. Uh, my contact information is up there with any questions. Thank you again. Are there any questions for Mr. Wilson? Thank you so much. The election committee will be called to order. At this time, I would ask uh, Josh Waller, our Director of Policy and Government Affairs, to come forward and give us a legislative update. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the uh, committee, uh, Mr. Chairman, full board, commissioner. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give you this, uh, this, tra this traditional update we do each month while the Georgia General Assembly is in session. So we'll kick it off here with the, the map we are used to seeing with the days X'd out, bringing us to calendar day 15. It's when they concluded this day at the General Assembly, it was day 19. So tomorrow, day 20 is that halfway point of their 40-day uh, session. As a reminder, we are about, uh, let me do the math here, a little bit over two and a half weeks from crossover day. 
So that's the last day the legislation has to pass at least one chamber. That bill itself has to pass at least one chamber to ensure that it moves on and has the potential to ultimately make it to the governor. It doesn't mean that the soul of the bill can. It, it, souls often find themselves exercised from one bill and possessing another. Um, so as you can see up here, this we had um, today we had the Senate Transportation Committee meeting. I'll provide you an update because one of our bills was in it. It was in it. We had a vigorous House Transportation Committee meeting last week dealing with the issue of truck weights, which you will hear a little bit about just slightly in my presentation. The chief engineer is going to provide an in-depth discussion on the impact of that legislation to y'all as part of the committee of the whole. Um, we had an initial just highlight one of the things that the, the new chairman of the Senate Transportation Committee thought was very important for that committee to hear was from our commissioner. Wanted them, especially with some new members, new to transportation and new to the General Assembly, to get to to meet the commissioner and hear hear from him an overview of the department, and really use that opportunity since there's such a big focus on freight and logistics. Use that opportunity to really talk about what we see when we look out over the next couple of decades in terms of freight growth and the challenges that we all need to to band together to rise up to meet. So I think the commissioner uh, hit that one out of the park so much so that the House Transportation Committee was uh, jealous and has asked for the same presentation at the commissioner's next availability. So um, that was uh, kind of committees up to this point. As we look to next week, want to highlight for y'all, I know that some of y'all are probably keenly aware of what's coming up, about uh, five of y'all at least, or, or six of y'all are, are keenly aware of what's next week, which are board elections. I've got them up there. So th they won't be in that Monday in sort of an observation of President's Day. Uh, so that first day back, we'll have those first tranche of four seats and then the second tranche of three seats on Wednesday. And we will expect, as we talk about legislation, including the truck weights legislation, next week could be a pretty pretty busy week. So you might see um, folks running all over the place, ties disheveled, hair a little mess, but pardon our, our progress. So next, a uh, little bit of an outlook. So our housekeeping bill, HB 52, which is our GDOT housekeeping bill one, we'll have a second one that's not yet been introduced. We're, we're working together with the chairman of the House Transportation Committee on timing of that and, and, and just making sure how it fits within the legislative process. But it actually, it passed. Um, we had to move the committees around because we had that meeting happen today. But luck, thankfully, the bill passed in its current form out of the Senate Transportation Committee unanimously as it passed both the House Committee and the full House unanimously uh, on its way to Senate rules and hopefully on the calendar very soon and, and to get to the governor's desk uh, for signature. So it's got some important legislation dealing with some updates on CMGC and some things tying back to some projects that we've we've talked about with the board. Next is electric vehicle legislation. You know, we try and get these presentations in the night before so they can get consolidated. So I've got a blank space on there that is hot off the press news um, on electric vehicles. So there's two bills right now, House Bill 307, which is uh, Chairman Alan Powell, Chairman of, Senate, of House Regula uh, Regulated Industries. And then that blank is House Bill 407 or 406, uh, Chairman Jasper Bill. That was dropped yesterday and assigned a bill this morning and assigned to committee. That, that bill has actually been assigned to a new committee called the House uh, Committee on Innovation, on Technology and Innovation, chaired by Representative Todd Jones out of Forsyth County. So that's, you know, we've talked about electric vehicle legislation and, and, and those components of those bills, they're a little bit different and there's there's some, some nuance difference, but I'll, I'll focus, just a reminder on those key, the key things. First and foremost is allowing us, allowing retailers to sell electricity for charging by the kilowatt hour. So the, all the bills will do that. They will ensure that seems to be one point of consensus that retailers should be able to sell by the kilowatt hour. And then they, the, the bills include regulatory pieces around the Department of Agriculture being similar to with gas pumps today. They will do inspection. They're proposed to do the inspections, setting standards, um, as well as establishing a permitting process so that especially when you start talking about accounting for the taxes, the equivalent motor fuel taxes on electricity, you have to know where these where these these chargers are and and get them in the system for for remitting that and so that bill also fully contemplates you know currently state law says that anything any energy source regardless of what it is if it powers a vehicle on the public roads it's a motor fuel so the law already provides that electricity is a motor fuel governed by the that is the, the bill affirms that, that that electricity is a motor fuel governed by the Constitution. 
So they, they work that through and work, work some language around making sure we, we have a good way to, to show equivalent kilowatt hours to a gallon of gasoline. And there's some nuance there. And I think the bill's still in the perfecting process to make sure they get that balance right. Senate side, um, SB 146, Steve Gooch, uh, Senator Steve Gooch has introduced that. Senate, that bill went to Senate Regulated Industries and they had a meeting yesterday, just, just a hearing only, uh, talking through the bill and taking testimony. I think we'll still probably see, you know, you might see some headlines here or there about industry. So the retailers, the convenience stores and having some back and forth with the power producers, the Georgia Power, the EMCs. They're still trying to work through some of their issues, but I know there's enough consistent consensus items that a bill should should ultimately make it to a governor. There may be some other things that are still kind of funded for the other day or they find a resolution and incorporate it into the, to the ultimate bill. Um, next is freight and logistics infrastructure. We're still expecting something to be done. I don't know that we will see a, an immediate standalone bill. But as, as mentioned with the commissioner coming to the Senate Transportation Committee, they were keenly keen to hear about the needs on freight. So freight is on everyone's tongues. They're just trying to figure out the best way to implement it. Ultimately, some kind of crossover interaction between that and the in electric vehicle conversation. And lastly, um, House Bill 189, which we, it now has a Senate counterpart. Again, this off the press uh, is Senate Bill 165 is the Senate version of the truck weight bill. Uh, it's and, and the chief engineer is going to go through in detail, but it, it basically it, it strikes the existing exemption, replacing it a 5% with a 12.5%, which allows for a gross 90,000 weight and lifts it from just being on certain commodities and agricultural products to universal. So the impacts of that are going to be detailed in the committee of the whole. Certainly, um, you know, the, there was a lot of, it was a five and a half hour committee meeting in house transportation. Certainly the department has you know, maintained the historical resolution that it has about the issue of increasing truck weights uh, and the challenges and in, to the infrastructure, which again, the chief engineer will go through. But I, I think that we'll see kind of where that goes. Um, but we're, our job at the end of the day is to continue to provide the facts on the impact. And so I think you'll, again, you'll get that deeper dive uh, here shortly. And with that, that wraps, wraps it up. Are there any questions that y'all may have, or if there's something that someone thinks I missed, I missed. Thank you, Josh. It's impossible. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Josh, I'm, I was confused by the reference to um, public electric charges and the potential to um, put a tax, a, a gasoline tax on those, given that electric vehicles are already taxed with the with the annual fee and most charging happens in at the home or or outside of these public charges how, how does that get reconciled so i think that you raised that's a lot of good questions that would be reconciled as part of that process i think what they're they're getting at first would be that when it comes to resale so they're, they're, i don't they're not looking at the issue of at home charging they're looking at this issue of now that we're authorizing resale what would be how would you transition and have an equivalent um to ensure that the, the same motor fuel tax is applied. I think what you're, you'll, you'll see questions in the long term about the, the annual fee. We've also had, there was also conversations ultimately about the VMT process and whether do you ultimately transition or provide optionality between that. Again, I, 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 you know, I, I can't speak for the future or speak for all the bill authors intents, but my understanding is the focus with respect to taxation deals with that third party retail not at home charging. The other piece of that, that that is that when you think about people traveling traveling through the state who today pay motor fuel tax, even though they don't live here, even though they, their final destination or origin is not here, they do pay motor fuel tax to account for their travel on our roads. Same thing would apply here is you, you'll have people who will be coming through the state who will, won't be paying an annual fee. And I think they wanna make sure that they're capturing those same transactions as well as those transactions transition to some proportion from, from traditional motor fuel, gasoline motor fuel, diesel motor fuel to electricity. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, Mr. Uh, Chairman? <laughs> Does anyone else There's have no a solution statement? as of yet is what I should have said. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question or a statement to be made? Hearing none, Josh, thank you so very much thank for that you, update. Very greatly appreciated.
And thank you for what you do at the Capitol to keep us addressed uh, with the issues that are there for us during the time from one of our committee meetings to another. And one other thing, and I'm sure one, one of these days, and I'm looking forward to it soon, we'll be giving a wrap up of the General Assembly session. Um, and there will be a lot of thank yous that need to be passed out, but I just, I do have to underscore, particularly around the demands that we're getting, the bills that are going on, there are a lot of people, some of them are standing behind me, commissioner there, a lot of people who will deserve a lot of thanks, including y'all for your engagement. This is um, no one individual, this is definitely a team effort and it's been underscored by uh, the need that we need to be responsive. So um, as, especially as you look at, at the amount of data that we've had to pull on truck weights, there's a lot of people who've worked really hard to get that information. So I, I, I need to say that we'll, we'll save a longer thank yous once we're done and <laughs> hopefully things work out a, a way, but, but I, I, I'd be remiss not saying that. So. Well, we thank each and every one of your involvement and the time that you give to protect our state and the infrastructure of which we have to make it even safer. Uh, any other comments? Seeing none, this meeting stands adjourned, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I'll call the Committee of the Whole to order. Two minutes late, I apologize. Hello. Um, we'll call the Committee of the Whole meeting to order, and first, uh, Mr. Franks is going to give us a Tier 1 wrap-up. Good afternoon, um, Chairman, members of the Committee, and other members of the Board present, and Commissioner. Um, I'm here to present to you guys the um, TIA update and a 10-year celebration, so to speak. So um, 2023 brings our 10-year anniversary in, and um, we're here to talk about 10 years of TIA. Um, I, thought, I thought the beginning of the presentation would be a good opportunity to kind of throw out some numbers to you guys, you know, to, to truly let you know um, what's gone into 10 years of the TIA program so far. So um, 10 years ago, we programmed or added TIA funds to 871 projects in 10 years. We've got those 871 projects construction ready. Um, through that time, we've processed over 10,500 invoices. Um, we've executed 271 local agreements for locals to deliver projects throughout the three original regions, plus a couple down in southern Georgia. Um, we've executed 36 consultant contracts with 132 individual task orders on those contracts. Um, we've had two CEI contracts with 73 individual task orders on those contracts to oversee projects under construction. Um, we've delivered 10 quick response contracts, just showing our flexibility and different styles of delivery that TIA can undertake. We've acquired or overseen um, 2,200 plus parcels. Um, and as, as part of delivering the first 10 years in the original three regions, we had Southern Georgia jump on in 2018 and add an additional 151 projects. And uh, starting out this year, we've got 787 additional projects and 10 more years worth of revenue collections in the original three regions. So it's, um, it's been a pretty productive first 10 years, I would say. Um, I, th I think the original three regions are pretty happy with the progress that we've made through this first 10 years. And uh, I'll get into an update of all, all four of our regions. Let me ask a question. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, are those 787 projects that you've added, are those projects under construction or they anticipate to get started soon? We, we have a couple that are not underway yet. Um, we don't have NTPs executed, but everything was construction ready by the end of last year. Okay. Thanks. Yes, sir. Excuse me, Kev, what, what, um, how much money was collected the first 10 years? 
I got a couple slides and I'll get to that one. Well, hurry up. I'm anxious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So um, here are our four regions. We've got CSRA, Heart of Georgia, River Valley, and Southern Georgia. Um, River Valley, Heart of Georgia, and CSRA are the original three regions. Um, here we go with our, our collections totals. Um, so the answer is um, broken down in each one of the regions. In CSRA, we've collected 746 million, River Valley 512 million, Heart of Georgia 335, Southern Georgia 269 and some change. A total to date as of the end of December of $1.8 billion. Um, 1.6 has gone to fund the original three um, regions. And um, if you look over at that, that far um, right column, you have the total discretionary money. And that's funds that go directly to the cities and counties in all four of these regions on a monthly basis. And, you know, that number's starting to get large over there now, $465 million to date um, for locals to deliver their own projects or to support transportation staff um, or, or basically to, you know, match uh, transit projects, match any other projects that they may have that they're wanting to advance from a local perspective. Um, <clears throat> Also, I'd like to report that we had a strong year-over-year -year growth um, that we saw in the tax collections this past year. Uh, we saw year-over-year -year growth of 8.3% in CSRA, 5.8% River Valley, and 7.4%, strangely enough, in heart of Georgia and in southern Georgia. So a strong year of collections in 2022 um, to wrap up the 10 years in the original three. <clears throat> So we've presented this slide and we present this slide, you know, as part of our transparency to all the citizens review panel um, meetings that we have throughout the years. And this slide is, has been what I, what I like to report is my bleak slide um, oftentimes. <clears throat> if, you, if you look all the way over to the far right column, you'll see the percent behind the original forecast. Um, we're presently, um, or we finished the 10 year collections window at 11.2% behind in CSRA, 13.8% behind in River Valley, 15.9% behind in Heart of Georgia. Now, I like to take the opportunity to look back at 2018 because that's when things, collections had trended down for a couple of years. So at one point in time in 2018, we were 16.6 behind in CSRA, 17.6 behind in River Valley, and 21.3% behind in, in heart of Georgia. So we've made tremendous headway with col good collections the past couple of years, and those good collections has enabled us to actually account for the increases in prices that we've seen since the COVID pandemic started. So um, a little bit of good news couched in, in that, um, that shortfall scenario. Um, also, I have to kind of kick back thanks to my, my predecessors along with, with the TIA program and, and locals and, and GDOT that's helped us out. Um, we, we were able to deliver band one, $37 million under budget. Um, we were able to deliver the band two projects at $33 million under budget. So that's how we've cut into those shortfalls by actually delivering the projects under budget, being aggressive with trying to get ahead of our schedules and, and take advantage of good opportunities whenever we see good prices coming in. Reemphasize the TIA one timeline. We've shown this slide quite a few times now over the years, and um, that that dot just keeps getting further and further to the right. Um, I, I didn't think we'd ever get here, but we we are full ten years in, and now we're going to start the project construction and closeout triangle there at the end. Um, heart of Georgia will probably close out first. It'll probably take us around two years to close out the Heart of Georgia program and get all those projects wrapped up and closed out in construction. And around three to four years in River Valley and CSRA, we had some major projects that let right at the end of um, band three. <clears throat> so just to further highlight what we've done in the first 10 years, 871 projects in the original three regions led to construction or advanced construction ready. Um, we already have 809 of those projects complete um, in the construction phase. I'd also like to highlight that even though TIA does not have a DBE, SDE requirement, we've had 
600 and, or not 600, sorry about that, 64.5 million in DBE and SBE participation. And that's putting us at around 8.6% um, program wide for DBE and SBE participation. Some of the 2022 highlights. Um, we let 127 projects to construction this past year. 46 projects were completed this past year, and we had expenditures of over $134 million. To jump into a quick update of each one of the regions, um, we had 84 original projects in CSRA. Um, we have currently 25 projects that are under construction or entering into construction and 59 projects wrapped up. Um, I'd like to give a big shout out to uh, <clears throat> Richmond and Columbia counties. They delivered a lot of the projects that were in their program. 51% uh, of those 84 projects were locally delivered. And that's one of the abilities that TIA has is to work with the locals to allow them to deliver their high profile high profile or high priority projects on their own schedules. So we can kind of get out of the way, work with them to help them streamline things and help them deliver those projects. So, and also like to celebrate that in CSRA, whenever they, they put TIA 2 on the ballot, that we passed with a 71% yes vote in 2020. So that further shows that the, the citizens in, in CSRA supported the TIA program and they feel that it's working. Um, by delivering the projects to construction. Highlight a couple of projects. We've got State Route 4, 15th Street widening here in Augusta. Um, this project represents a TIA investment of over $7.5 million and also emphasizes a project that was blended with state funds. So this is a, a combined effort between GDOT and TIA to deliver this project and, and GDOT to assist with the budget on it. This project's about 50% through in construction. Um, we've got State Route 388 widening. So this was a, a corridor with three projects. We're just emphasizing, highlighting this one project, this active in construction right now. So the TIA investment on this one unit alone of $16 million. Um, and this was a local let. Columbia County administered this project and advanced it to construction. We're roughly 49% complete in construction. This is the Fifth Street Bridge. Um, this bridge actually connects Georgia and South Carolina, and it was rehabbed and converted into a fully pedestrian bridge. So this ties into their streetscapes and um, their overall plan to um, enhance pedestrian connectivity between Georgia or between Augusta and North Augusta on the other side of the river. And I think it, it turned out very well, and they're planning to have a bunch of events on this bridge. Um, to celebrate the, the completion of this project. Jumping over to River Valley, River Valley had 23 projects total. We currently have six of those projects under construction and 17 projects complete. Um, River Valley was a little bit different than CSRA and, and GDOT delivered the majority of the projects, but 17% of these projects were locally delivered. And, and we we're proud to say that their yes vote was 55.3%. Um, this previous year to continue, and that was an increase from their, their first time as well. So we're looking for, uh, looking to celebrate the next 10 years in River Valley. <clears throat> uh, Buena Vista, this is a DDI in Southern Columbus. Um, this project is under construction. They're pouring the phase one section of the bridge right here. Um, and this project represents a $53 million investment in TIA revenue in, in River Valley region. And we're about 50% done in construction on that job. We've got the US 280 corridor in Crisp County. Um, this is, they're getting started in paving. They've widened this roadway from a, a two lane and a three lane facility. They had a couple passing lanes through the corridor, but we're widening into a four lane. This represents a $33 million investment in the River Valley region. And um, this, this continued investment in the US 280 corridor will be continued in TIA 2. So the four lanes will, will continue all the way to Americas from the bridge that we built in um, Band 1 in Crisp County. 
Jumping in the heart of Georgia, we had 764 projects, and this region, I always like to point out, was incredibly different from the other regions. They decided to really emphasize and, and prioritize their funding on local city streets, local county roads that hadn't had enough funds to be invested in and maintained for, for years. So you really lean more to a local flavor here in this region. 62% um, of the projects in this region were delivered local let, and their yes vote was 63.5% last year. So that was an increase of 11.8% over the first referendum. So it was a, <clears throat> a big increase, and, and throughout this, this 10 years, we've paved in a, in excess of 750 miles of road lane, road, road miles in, in the heart of Georgia. A couple of projects to highlight in, in heart of Georgia, Ottawa Hall region. <clears throat> We've got Hillcrest Parkway here in Dublin. This is a 2.5 mile widening project um, and represented a $17 million in TIA investment in the heart of Georgia region. Uh, and this project just finished up in construction. The vast majority of the projects in Heart of Georgia were resurfacing, resurfacing style projects. Here's, here's two roads in Emanuel County. Um, this is 5.1 miles of resurfacing and represented a little bit over a million dollar investment. Now jumping into a quick um, update on Southern Georgia. We are currently starting off band two, um, but we started advancing projects early to band two when we were in band one because collections have been a, a little bit ahead of what they were projected to be originally. So we're in really good shape on our timeline. We're trying to get in advance of it so we can advance all the construction, all the projects to construction based on when the funding comes in um, and not when the 10, 10 year time frame is. <clears throat> Southern Georgia had 151 projects. Um, we currently have 24 projects that are under construction and 74 projects that are complete to date. Um, we're currently uh, seeing the locals deliver these projects at a 51% clip. And um, just wanted to share with you guys that the um, majority of the counties have passed a resolution down in Southern Georgia and we held our first regional roundtable meeting last week. Um, so they are already planning out the next 10 years worth of projects in southern Georgia. There will be a call for projects um, coming up shortly, and the future 10-year list will be built over this summer with a stated goal of the regional roundtable of taking that referendum to the spring ballot of next year. Got a couple projects to highlight down in southern Georgia. Here's a couple in Berrien County. Um, this is 7.7 .7 miles of resurfacing and represented a $2 million investment in the Southern Georgia region. One of the larger projects down in Southern Georgia was a project that GDOT was already working on and then um, the Regional Roundtable and Executive Committee the first time wanted to make sure that this project was it advanced into construction early so they identified it as a TIA project and kicked in an additional 19.4 or 19 point yes 19.4 million dollars in TIA um, <clears throat> to make sure that this project moves forward um, and as you can see we're we're getting getting really started good down there in construction um, we're about to get started on the bridge we're approximately 20 percent through um, <clears throat> another resurfacing bundle um, in the city of Patterson. This project completed 10.7 miles of asphalt patching, leveling and resurfacing on 39 individual streets. So um, projects like this, when we've got a city that's got a batch, we can bundle those together and see a better price instead of individually putting all those out. So sometimes this is the best way to do business and that represents uh, approximately a $1.1 million investment in the Southern Georgia region. Um, and I know it's a celebration of 10 years and kind of a 10 year wrap up, but um, we're not gonna rest on our laurels. We've got quite a lot of work to do. Um, we've got 162 projects um, identified for TIA 2 and CSRA. Of those, we've already got five that are under design, three that are under construction, 
and 30 projects that are in various stages of procurement or working with the locals to get local agreements put in place to get started off to a quick start in CSRA. Heart of Georgia too, <clears throat> we've got 580 additional projects um, and we currently have 56 projects that are currently underway, are working with the locals to get local agreements put, on, put in place so we can get the locals started on those locally delivered jobs. We kind of slow our, our schedules a little bit on some of the GDOT lets to allow the locals to step up with their priorities and advance their priorities first on, on need. And in River Valley, um, we have 45 new projects coming on the books this year. Um, and we currently have one local let project that is underway and we've got the, some procurement underway to get PE services on, on various other projects. <clears throat> I would like to kind of take this opportunity to do a thank you. Um, I know I get to come up here and talk to you and I'm fortunate to, to let you know what, what's going on with Tia and everything, but we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a lot of people's help. Um, I'd like to thank our AECOM program management team and all their subs. Uh, right now we've got projects that are under construction all over the southern part of the state. Um, without, without that program management team in place, there's no way we would be able to deliver this with the small amount of staff that GDOT has allocated to the TIA program. Um, I'd like to thank GDOT management. Um, a lot of these projects are blended projects and GDOT management has always supported the delivery of the TIA program. Um, I'd like to thank all the cooperating offices, the financial divisions, the districts, OPD, OID, JISVIC, and the Department of Revenue who we work with on a, on a monthly basis on securing the funds and making sure that we've got our cash flow set up for our annual plan. Um, the citizens review panels um, and the regional commissions that work with us to make sure that we're meeting all our legal requirements on an annual basis. Um, the local governments that delivered 271 um, local let contracts throughout this 10 year period. Um, we couldn't, couldn't deliver a program of this size without, without help from the local governments. And this truly is a local program that's supported by GDOT. So um, enabling the locals that can deliver the projects and want to deliver the project projects has been a huge benefit to the program and a huge benefit to the locals to step up and ensure that their priorities get worked on first. And lastly, I would like to thank the, the previous T administrators and, and my staff. Um, without Mike Dover and Kelvin Mullins laying out a plan and making good decisions at the time that they made them, we wouldn't have been in the place that we are now. So um, one thing I like to say about T is um, we identify everything and we make the best decisions we have on the information that we have. And um, we'll, we'll continue to manage that way. And um, at this time, I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Are there any questions? Comments? Well, what's that? Yeah, please do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a great celebration. In fact, I feel like we have a 12 year old in front of us. It's kind of put 10 years, but it started in advance of the actual collection that started in 2013. The referendum was in 2012, the legislation passed in 2010, which makes me feel old because it seems like just yesterday. Um, Kenneth did a great job laying out all the complexities and the support and the partnership it takes to deliver a 10-year program. And I'll, I'll go back to, as Dennis was so eager to get to the money, the, the his, well, I figure what, what you called it, the slide you don't like to talk about, the $2.04 billion projected revenue and we delivered everything or delivering everything on $1.8 billion. That's not easy. And, as, and I appreciate you giving Mike Dover and Kelvin Mullins a shout out for who helped administer this 10 year journey along the way um, because we had to make hard decisions along the way and it's truly design and construct to budget. Uh, and, and that takes it takes a little bit of an iron fist, fist, but a gentle hand to work with those cities and the counties to deliver the projects that they want it and that they put on their improved investment list. And sometimes, uh, sometimes we had to say, sorry, you can't have everything you thought you were going to have, but you're going to get the project that meets the 
intended purpose on the improved investment list. And as you recall, this is a the, uh, unlike county T splice programs where they'll say we're going to spend X percentage on this and X percentage on that. Every project had an approved budget at the beginning of the 10 years. If you think we got the approved budgets right 12 years ago uh, in 2022 dollars, we didn't get it right. I don't think anybody could have seen the inflationary pressures that we saw. We saw normal growth rates and to the point there was a couple of there was a couple of changes in state tax law that had a big impact on revenue. That's why there's a big difference between 2.04 billion and 1.8 billion that nobody could have foreseen and nobody really understood, but it was up to Kenneth, Kelvin and Mike to manage that along the way. And so I, I'm just so proud. I mean, it is it is amazing to see that $1.8 billion of goodness administered in these regions that I can't imagine. And when we you remember 2012 was way before the Transportation Funding Act of 2015. We literally had hardly any money to work with. And that's why this that's why this legislation was passed, because uh, the General Assembly and, and the governor at the time understood that we've got to do something for transportation that made a huge impact, just a huge impact. So Kenneth was right in acknowledging so many people. Uh, the finance is part of this. We've always managed that this, these are not GDOT dollars at all. They're local government dollars. It's the citizens that voted for it in these regions. And believe me, uh, you, you all have been part of the political process somewhere along the way of getting consensus among cities and counties that are not even in the same county <laughs> and try to try to get to a, a, a investment a financially constrained investment list I had I had a lot of fun doing that actually but it was it was hard I mean everybody's list of wants and desires and needs are way greater than the money that we even projected back then so it's a journey but just fix holds the dollars those those dollars that revenue collects just fix holes, and Kenneth has to work closely with them. He he's a great economist, by the way. You don't know that about Kenneth. He's an engineer, but he plays an economist often, and actually works with an economist because we have to look at the what's the revenue forecast look like. What are the economists saying so that they can basically sort of cash flow and and have a cash curve so that we administer these projects in within the bands and Kenneth talked about the bands that's the other thing the improvement investment list said these projects will happen in these time periods so we we had to deliver so they did a great job and again local dollars shepherding it through there it's hard to believe that the 10 years is up obviously finished projects as he showed you still will finish past the 10 years but the collections are through um, and have ramped back up into TIA 2 so with this great celebration, Kenneth has committed to 10 more years as tenant to you administrator. We got you on record for that. Uh, these other guys are quitters. You know, we ran Mike off and ran Kelvin to District 1. So, you, you know, we're going to keep you. And uh, But, Mr. Chairman, this is this is quite an accomplishment, um, something to truly be celebrated. It's unlike it, – I don't know of any other state that has anything quite like this, quite honestly. A lot of counties have single t splots obviously, and there's a – whole lot of counties, I don't remember how many on top of my head, but a whole lot of counties in Georgia have a single t splice but this regional approach has been fantastic. And as affirmed by the voters, and, that's, and Kenneth mentioned that, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with him, that the affirmation of the positive percentage votes, and if you think about when they were held last year, a few, one, I guess, was a little earlier in the year. It was in 2020. And that was 2020. Yep. But think about the economic times we were in when people, the citizens, had to vote to say, yes, we're going we're gonna to do a sales tax to, for transportation regionally. Uh, this speaks to the, to if you deliver on what you say you'll do, people will support you. So uh, we believe that to be true uh, as a testament, and uh, the progress has been made. And I can't think that. I would uh, think that Georgia would not be in the place it's in today had it not be for these original three regions uh, to make this decision and for these investments to be made, uh, that we're yielding the benefits now of a lot of economic development and continued economic development. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for letting me ramble, but it's a it's a very proud day. And uh, his first slide was confetti. We thought that would make a big mess down here, but 
but the first slide was the confetti and the fireworks and uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of great work across across the board from everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Mr. Floyd. Uh, a big portion of these tea projects in this district and uh, they are well thought of and uh, they are really to be appreciated and see the progress that they are making. It's been real good. Mr. Franks, thank you so much. Congratulations on behalf of the rest of the board on your tremendous success. Thanks, sir. And now we get to hear from our chief engineer about the truck weight issue. I'm assuming that that bridge between Georgia and South Carolina, that pedestrian bridge, we're going to have to keep the, the weight down to 80,000 pounds, right? Well, it's not for trucks. It should be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Chairman Abel and members of the board. House Bill 189 was introduced at the House about two weeks ago, and then one week ago on February 9th, the Commissioner and I testified before the House Transportation Committee on the impacts of the bill. And there's a lot of passion on this topic, and you may have heard from some folks, but I want you all to be informed. So I'm going to give you the presentation that we gave the House Transportation Committee um, and just present the facts that we presented to them last week. So House Bill 189 proposes to increase truck weights by keeping the current legal weight limits, but allowing a 12.5% variance on the maximum total vehicle weight and on the axle weights. The language of calling it a variance is really just semantics because it applies to all trucks and all loads. So this bill will increase the legal gross vehicle weight to 90,000 pounds for all trucks and will also increase the allowable axle weight. An increase in gross vehicle weight limitations is of serious concern to GDOT. GDOT will be compelled to immediately post restrictions on a significant number of bridges statewide due to, this, due to HB 189. Because the 12.5% variance also applies to the axle weights, this will affect multiple configurations of trucks, not just tractor trailers. Additional posted bridges will create longer detours that are required and enforceable, leading to additional miles driven on the roadways. Some of the long-term impacts is that HB 189 will accelerate deterioration of bridges and pavements. Both higher gross vehicle weight and higher axle weights mean more severe damage to bridges and roadway pavements. To maintain a state of good repair, GDOT and local governments will have to redirect funding from significantly from other projects to increase bridge and maintenance budgets. So as someone responsible for maintaining our state's infrastructure, I'm just here to talk about the engineering of this bill and to inform you about the factual impacts. And these impacts are real and it's why we cannot support HB 189. Georgia has 14,876 structures. And since the Transportation Funding Act of 2015, GDOT has replaced 424 bridges statewide, about $1.9 billion invested in bridges since 2015. And that's also including about $564 million on local bridges. In that time, we have only reduced the number of posted structures by 148. And that's because older bridges keep getting added to the posted list just due to wear and tear. So currently, we have 1,404 posted bridges, and a bridge that is load restricted or posted means that it cannot carry the legal weights that are allowed by law. So to remain open to traffic, a deficient bridge is posted with a sign with reduced weight limits like you see in the, sign, in the picture there. But I want to be very clear that if a bridge is unsafe, we close it. And because we inspect all of our bridges every two years, we are on top of this. The legal weight limits in Georgia depends on what is being hauled and what road you're traveling on. Interstate weight limits are set in federal law. So on our strongest, highest use highways where weight limits are enforced with way stations, the weight limit is 80,000 pounds. Currently, state law allows higher weights on non-interstate state routes with exemptions for certain commodities 
at an even higher level there. It's a 5% variance allowed for certain agricultural and forest product commodities. Georgia currently has the highest allowable axle weights of all of our surrounding states. So you can see there proposed HB 189 weights will add a 12.5% variance to the original state route limits there. If a truck is picking up or delivering on a local road, the state route limits apply to the local road. So they, trucks of these weights are only supposed to drive on local routes if they are picking up or delivering to an address on the local route. But because the state route weight limits apply in those cases, we apply these weights to local bridges as well as state bridges. So I want to be clear that HB 189 is not just proposing a 6,000 pound increase in weights. 25% of our trips right now are made in that special state route commodity exemptions category there. So for 75% of truck traffic, this will be a 10,000 pound increase. This table shows the design loads that Georgia bridges were designed for. If you include the unknown category, about 50% of local bridges were not designed to consistently handle trucks or loads over 30,000 pounds. 30,000 pounds is like a single axle box truck. 97% of Georgia state route bridges were not designed for loads over 80,000 pounds. Now you may have heard about how there are some loads that come from the port that have 100,000 pounds, so I want to address this. Federal law allows up to 100,000 pounds on the interstates for non-divisible loads coming to and from the port, international loads. Containerized freight, just based on the size of the containers, is generally not going to weigh 100,000 pounds. And according to the Georgia Ports Authority, this is less than 1% of the freight moving in and out of the ports is at 100,000 pounds. So it's a very small percentage of the truck traffic. But this is by federal law. They have to have an annual permit. They receive maps of the allowable routes that they are allowed to drive on. And so comparing that to an across the board increase in weight to 90,000 pounds is just not the same thing. And yes, 100,000 pounds does add stress to our bridges and roads, and that's why we inspect our bridges every two years. This slide shows the current age of Georgia bridges. And you can see that most of our bridges are over 50 years old. The average bridge age is 44 years old, but they were designed for a 50-year life. Let me restate that. So our average bridge age is 44 years old, but they were designed for a 50-year life. Since the Transportation Funding Act of 2015, we've invested a lot in our bridges. But despite spending more than we ever have on bridges, we spend about $320 million a year replacing bridges our number of posted bridges remains pretty steady because we have so many older bridges. The bridges we build for today, we designed for a 75-year lifespan, but the older ones were designed for a 50-year lifespan. And we take really good care of our bridges. We do a lot of bridge maintenance, but I like to use the analogy of, you know, if I get a knee replacement today, I'll have a brand new knee, but I'm still in my 55-year-old body. So same with a bridge, when you um, do maintenance on the bridge, it extends the life a little bit, but it doesn't make it a new bridge. And eventually that bridge will have to be replaced. And keep in mind these bridges, um, when they're reaching their design life, they were also designed for much less volume than we see today and for much less weight. The trucks back then were not as heavy as the modern trucks we have today. This map shows the current posted bridges in Georgia. The yellow are posted bridges, the black dots are closed bridges. Good, fair, and poor are condition ratings that we put on our bridges, but a bridge can be in fair condition and still be, post, still be load restricted or posted. So we have 1,404 structures that are posted and can't carry an 84,000 pound truck. And that number is not static. It changes every day as we complete new bridge inspections and as new bridges are added to the list for posting. Per federal law, we inspect all of our bridges every two years. We provide and pay for that inspection service for local governments on locally owned structures. Many states don't do this for local governments. This inspection is not a visual glance. 
It's an engineering inspection of every structural element of the bridge. We report 320 data elements for each bridge we inspect. So what determines why a bridge is load restricted? Load ratings are based on the original bridge design and adjusted for the deterioration of the bridge at the biannual inspection. Load restrictions posted are based on the state's legal loads for trucks. And these load restrictions are not just for the max legal limit on a truck, but are based on the number of axles and length of the truck. One of the reasons we can't support HB 189 is because it will result in an additional 1,408 bridges to be load restricted, more than doubling the number of restricted bridges. These increased weights will have a cascading effect and with time more bridges will be closed. As I said, GDOT maintains a rigorous database of structures in Georgia and it's updated every day as we open new bridges and complete inspections. We know exactly what we're dealing with here. So when I show you this map covered in red dots, it's not a scare tactic, it's not a guess. This is what will happen if this bill passes. It's factual. We will also require local governments to post their bridges. They will have to do so. If more bridges are posted, the routes available for heavier trucks will be limited, resulting in longer trip mileage. The state of Georgia has had an emergency executive order in place for almost three years, allowing certain permitted loads an exception for up to 95,000 pounds. So why didn't we post bridges for the executive order? And why hasn't the sky fallen in the last three years if this is such a big deal? So the emergency executive order, although temporary, has gone on a long time, much longer than anyone would have expected. And we have complete respect for the reason and the intentions behind the executive order and the goals to keep the state's economy going during the pandemic and in the recovery of the pandemic. But the facts are that allowing heavier weights on the highways and bridges shortens the life cycles of our bridges and pavements. These are not immediate impacts. They reveal themselves over time. And we're spending more on bridges than we ever have. But with these weights, we will have more restrictions in place than ever before. And the damage to our infrastructure can't be reversed. The last three years emergency executive order, one, required a permit. Two, was subject to the conditions of the executive order for certain commodities and specific haul distances. And three, the permit holders were provided a map of the allowable routes that were unique to the executive order. The permit had to be renewed with every update of the executive order. And based on the number of permits issued by the Department of Public Safety, it appears to be that it was much less than 1% of the truck volumes that travel in our state. So under the executive order, these bridges weren't posted yet. So the routes were not as long as they're gonna be. For HB 189, there will be no permits, no restrictions on hauling distance, and no restrictions on product. The executive order and HB 189 are not comparable to each other in any way. It is just not apples to apples. HB 189 will be universal to all trucks under all conditions and it will be permanent. The two situations are foundationally different. When we presented to the House Transportation Committee last week, we gave several slides with examples of longer trips and detours and how it affects travel across the state. In the interest of time, I'm showing you one example here, and this is in Effingham County, where a six mile trip will have a 31 mile detour for a truck carrying HB 189 loads. And remember, these trucks should not go on local routes unless they are delivering to or picking up on that road. So the perception that hauling more weight has economic benefits because fewer trips could be eroded due to the longer trips that will have to be driven because the heavier weight can't go over the bridges. And Miss Ann might look at this map and say, well, I know there's a shortcut you can get around there, but remember, they're not supposed to drive on local roads. But they're going to do it anyway because that's a really long detour. And so that's why this bill is so bad for local infrastructure because folks will try to avoid long detours like that. So, you know, the, the comment has been made that this, this bill will reduce the number of trips driven. So I just wanna say that, you know, Georgia is growing. The freight in Georgia is growing. And every time they've added a special exemption for a commodity to our truck weights in the last 25 years, 
the comment was made, oh, it will mean fewer trips because you can have a heavier truck. Our traffic volumes have not gone down. Our truck volumes have not gone down. Um, freight is significantly growing in Georgia, and a higher weight limit means all these new volumes will carry the heavier loads. In Wisconsin, a study was commissioned by the forest products industry that looked at raising the weights of trucks, and it resulted in additional bridge postings. And the additional bridge postings made the weight increase not worth it because the detour routes were just too costly. And once you add 10, 20, 30 miles to a trip, it really adds up to the daily number of loads that can be taken. So now I'm going to talk about the long-term impacts of HB 189. And that's the increased damage and deterioration to our infrastructure and to the local government's infrastructure. Whoops, I had some animation there I wasn't aware of. Um, when we say this bill will add stress to our bridges, what we mean is stress is deflection on the bridge beams. So if you think of an example of a piece of plywood sitting on two sawhorses, if you stand on top of it, this plywood's going to bend a little in the middle. And that's what our bridge beams do. And there's only so much that the plywood can bend. And it's the same with our bridge beams. The heavier the truck, the more the beam will deflect. When engineers design things, they include a factor of safety in their design. And that's the same with our bridges. But higher truck weights eat away at the factor of safety that's built into our bridges. If the weights are raised to 90,000 pounds, a weight higher than 97% of the bridges in Georgia were designed for. Every pass of a heavier load, the beams will deflect and take a little more life of the bridge. The majority of Georgia's bridges have a 30 to 40 foot span length, and our modeling shows that these lengths will be excessively impacted by the heavier loads. Axle spacing is just as important as weight to a bridge. If you imagine, well, if you look at the picture here of the shorter truck, you can see that the force is applied to the top of the bridge and it goes through the entire bridge, but it's much more concentrated with the short truck. And these short, stout trucks really do a number on our bridges. Because the variance in HB 189 applies to axle weights, not just the overall vehicle weight, that means a dump truck or a concrete truck can be a lot heavier than it is now, significantly adding damage to our bridges. Like bridges, damage to Georgia's pavements will also be increased by the fill. Depending on volume, we expect to get about 15 to 20 year life out of our pavements. It's a lot less for some of the really busy routes like the connector out there, but that's the general rule. So managing limits on axle loads is very important to prolonging pavement life. A pavement that is subjected to higher axle loads will develop cracks and redding far sooner. One of the foundational pavement design rules is that the stress on the pavement, the greater the axle load of a vehicle, the greater the stress on the road caused by the vehicle. Specifically, the stress on the road increases in proportion to the fourth power of the axle load of the vehicle traveling down the road. To the fourth power. That means that by increasing axle weights by 12.5%, the fourth power rule would anticipate damage to increase by 60%. And this would reduce our pavement life nearly in half. A 20-year pavement would now last 12 years. This may seem drastic, but it's real. It's in every textbook about asphalt design, and it's been confirmed through many studies. But if you think about a roadway pavement, when we drive across it, you get the cracks on top, we do crack filling, and then eventually we mill off the top and we resurface. And that's how we've maintained good roads in Georgia, is by a cycle of resurfacing. When you have the real heavy axle weights, it presses down on the pavement, just like that plywood I was talking about in the example for the bridge, and the cracks start at the bottom. And when you have bottom-up cracking, that's when the water can get into the pavement and the pavement starts to come apart from the inside out. You cannot resurface a pavement that has the bottom-up cracking. You have to rebuild it. Rebuilding roads cost six to eight times more than resurfacing roads. It's a significant impact, and that's why it's an exponential impact when you have heavier trucks. The impacts of HB 189 will be much greater on the local roads. Local governments own six times more centerline miles than the state. Many local governments don't use a pavement design engineered for freight. It's just a standard base and pave. 
And we, I mean, we hear about it all the time. We get letters from local governments asking for help to fix roads that have been torn up by a, you know, a new manufacturing plan or a logging operation just because the roads aren't, they aren't prepared for those kind of weights. They, they can't keep up now. I don't know how they'll keep up if this passes. One thing Russell said last week that I really liked is that small signs don't stop trucks. <laughs> Um, the top picture was taken randomly. We were doing a load testing on a bridge in Bryan County and just happened to capture this 135,000 pound truck with, it's got a 66,000 pounds on a tandem axle. And we were load testing because we had concerns about this bridge and um, we were using wind scales to correlate to the strain on the bridge. And this was way more strain than we expected. The other picture is from an inspection showing a log truck restriction on a 27,000 ton restriction there on the bridge, but if that truck is heavily loaded, it's got to be at least 54,000 pounds or more. That's a full log truck in Colquitt County, 42 tons if legal on a 27 ton bridge. So everyone doesn't do this. I'm not, a, I'm not saying that they do, but I'm just saying it does happen. And when you post all these bridges and there's pressure and there are long detours, it's, it's going to happen more. And, you know, MCCD, our Department of Public Safety, has the best staff around. They have 236 people on staff. They can't babysit 2,800 bridges. So this impact is real, and this does happen. So among the things you may have heard is that we are being compared to other states. So the premise of HB 189 is let's be like other states with the higher gross vehicle weight limits. Just keep in mind that those other states and the higher weight limits, none of those are across the board for all trucks. They are all exemptions, many of them requiring permits that cost money for agriculture and forest products. None of those are across the board. And when you look at our neighboring states and the condition of their bridges, we're well on our way to being like them if, that's, if this bill were to pass. So it's just worth noting that the other states with the higher pounds, their bridges are not in very good condition. So let me conclude with focus on the last bullet point here that um, HB 189 doesn't necessarily do what's being intended and it will cost billions more in maintenance, rehabilitation, and reconstruction rather than advancing other critical product projects. You know, Georgia is growing. We are um, the Office of Planning is wrapping up their freight plan. We, we, we're going to have needs to build for capacity and to accommodate the new freight that's coming to Georgia. Not, we don't want to be in a place where we're just doing maintenance and rebuilding and keeping the status quo and going backwards. The impacts to the cities and counties will likely be six times what the impact is to us. And um, we estimate that the cost to maintain what we've got now will be an increase in maintenance of pavements alone in the terms of like five to eight hundred million dollars a year. We currently spend about four hundred million dollars a year on pavements. And for bridges, bridges cost, an average cost of a bridge is five million dollars a piece. So if you're adding fourteen hundred and eight bridges to be posted, the cost to replace those is seven billion dollars. And with the current funding levels, it would take about 23 years to get back to where we are today. So it's important to understand the short-term and long-term impacts of HB 189 to our infrastructure, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, let, me, let me take the, the first question, more of a comment, and say that you know um, every session there's legislation that sometimes rises to the level of public discourse and anger and, and concern. In this particular case, it's pretty wonky. But this is bad public policy, and I strongly endorse the efforts that you and the Commissioner and Josh and others and all of us on the board who have, have made our voices heard <coughs> at the Capitol um, to continue to push um, for con reconsideration of, of this um, legislation. Thanks for everything you've done. I've got a 3.30 meeting I've got to run to, so I'd like to hand it over to oh. Mr. Brown to oh. lead the rest of, or to conclude this. Okay. All right. Thank you. I have a question. All right. Go ahead. First of all, Mike, thank you. That's a very good report. Very insightful. I have two main questions, and one relates back to the 
the state map you showed with all the dots on it, where it's uh, posted bridges and potential posted bridges. Do we know of, of that, how much of that m might be designated freight routes? Um, I don't know. I, we could find out which ones are on freight routes. But, it's but you safe. can see that 681 of them are on mm. local roads and yeah. are definitely not on designated freight routes. But I, I'm assuming by all the dots I see, it's safe to assume that there's a there's going to be a number of affected bridges that are on designated freight routes, yeah. which could produce a consequence of declassifying them as freight routes. I mean, that, that would be the logic con logical conclusion. So I would... I, I'd be curious to know that. And my second question, are the are the Association of Counties and Cities, are, are, are they useful allies with, with us on, on, on contending with this bill? Absolutely. Um, at the hearing last week, um, GMA spoke and ACCG both spoke out against this bill. They are allies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK. Yes, sir. Uh, Meg, yeah, thank you for presentation. Um, so, of the fourteen hundred additional bridges that you anticipate posting, so the variance now is up to eighty-four thousand. Mm -hmm. The variance will go to ninety. Mm -hmm. So, so can we assume then that all fourteen hundred of those are okay for eighty-four? or you just haven't gotten around to posting them yet? No, they are okay with what we have now. Believe me, we we every time we inspect a bridge, if we need to change in posting, there's a deadline for when that sign has to get on So, the So we're really talking about 6,000 additional pounds? Mm -hmm. Plus the axle loadings are going up as well. That's, that's affected so, as well. So 6,000 does a... Yeah. Well, so, but... But we currently post for the 84. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm not I'm not an engineer. Um, I know that's a shock that a lot of y'all hear me say <laughs> that. But uh, it doesn't seem like a lot of additional weight the six that, mm -hmm. to go from 84 to 90. D d describe what that that smaller weight difference makes. I shouldn't have taken that slide out, Russell. Yeah. <laughs> We had a slide last week that shows what was the truck you used as an example. So it, it's hard for people to understand what six thousand pounds is. So six thousand pounds is a standard cab F one fifty. So put that on top of a log truck. Yeah. Think about strapping that on top of a log truck. That's yeah. what six thousand pounds is. Ten thousand pounds. The actual increase is ten thousand pounds to everything that is not exempt now, which is select ag products, some quarry materials, and the like. 10,000 pounds is a 2,500 HD crew cab, four by four. Strap that on top of the tractor trailer. But 6,000 pounds doesn't sound like a lot unless it's sitting on you, right? Yeah. But Meg's previous slide is, is that's the law. Go back to the bridges. The bridges were designed for technically 72,000 pounds. There's a factor of safety. I don't remember if Meg said it. Every 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 engineer builds a factor of safety in anything they design. So what? this 84,000 pounds does is erode the factor of safety on a brand new bridge, mm -hmm. not to mention any health issues the bridge has. And I, I tell everybody and I've told, told the committee is, you know, bridges are just like all of us sitting around the table. We all get older and we all have more health issues the older we get. So you're really looking at a 90,000 pound load on a bridge that was technically designed for 72,000 pounds. Go back, Meg, to your to the bridge designs because the fact of the matter is none of these bridges are designed to hold that amount of weight. 2.8% uh, on the state route and 2% on the local route are designed to hold 100,000 pounds. Um, so that's the issue and especially on the county bridges as Meg said, 50% of those are only designed to hold a, a two axle box truck. Think think about your old, your old two axle box delivery truck, you know, a U-Haul truck. That's a that's a thirty thousand pound truck. Mm -hmm. So you're asking to hold ninety thousand pounds on thirty thousand pound bridges. So that's why you got to put the sign up. Or you're asking to hold ninety thousand ninety thousand pounds to go on an eighty thousand pound bridge. Uh, some of those are okay because they're in good condition. But the ones that are not in good condition will have a sign that says you can't go across because of the gross vehicle weight and then the axle spacing. 
uh, as Meg showed on that picture of a long, a long, the longer the truck for a bridge, the better. The shorter the truck, <laughs> the worse. Uh, so, but that's the, and that's, and that's, it's a common, it's a common sense thing. Well, 6,000 pounds doesn't sound like a lot, but how do you like to get hit by F-150 or, or 2,500? Six and 10,000 pounds makes a lot of difference. And what, additional. <laughs> as evidence in the picture of the logging truck going over the posted bridge, what are the consequences and, and who who would give a ticket to a, someone that goes over bridges? So by posted? law, the only people that can enforce weight limits are the Department of Public Safety Motor Carrier Compliance Division. Local enforcement cannot enforce weight limits. So r really they're going to do what they <laughs> There's no way we're going to stop those trucks. Yeah. Back back of the napkin math on MCCD, each each of their people, if everybody's in the field, they they ha they would be assigned over 525 miles of roadway to patrol if I if I remember that correct, but not all those people in the field, a lot of them are at way stations and and the like. Uh, so, you know, as Meg said, you know, they, there's not enough coverage to, you know, try to keep up with with weights. And and they do, and they're not there just for weights. They're the, 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 one of their biggest charges is safety inspections. Yeah. yeah. When's, when's the last time the, the, the uh, weights were increased? I think uh, 2006, Josh, is that right? Commodities that they'd be four thousand pounds, five percent, and then they'd add another one the next year, and another one the next year. Oh. Tapered off about the late two thousand eight, two thousand nine period. Mm -hmm. Okay. For a long period of time, they were adding one and another. And who comes up with this idea of increasing the? Uh, uh, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I know. So somebody's lobbying. Um, the forest, the forester group, the forester group. It, it, I, I'm sure there are others, but the forester group I know are. And what's the rationale for? I mean, I know they give this when they in, in the bill, I guess, for wanting to increase it to ninety thousand. I, I think their rationale is that they think it will. Um, they can carry heavier loads and they will make a fewer trips. I think there's a, a shortage on, in all industries right now on truck drivers, and that's what they're trying to address. Okay. Brown. Yes, Mr. Brown, in, in, in the hearing last week, both people for increasing truck weights and against trucking weights basically commented that the big, there's, there's issues in, in labor and having drivers. And especially uh, in the forest products industry, it's hard work. It's not it's not Amazon driving around the city. It's dri driving in tough conditions. But the biggest cost drivers for trucking is labor and insurance. Uh, and it's fuel. Those are the if you you just Google any of you, you can Google cost per mile to operate a truck, and those are what that's what at the top. So. The notion, the notion is, and that's why Meg said sort of the, the contents, and again, I want to go back, and we didn't say this, but we want Georgia to be the number one state to do business, mm -hmm. period. I mean, we, we focus on that. We just talked about TIA and the celebration of that. That's, you know, all that. So this, I want to make sure we're clear. We're, you know, this is not something against the forest products industry. We want them to be successful. But Georgia does have the number one forest products industry in the southeast, we have the number one poultry industry in agribusiness for, for good old Gainesville, Georgia, with a lot of poultry. <laughs> and we're the number one state to do business for the ninth year in a row. So we have a lot of goodness going. So I want to make sure people know that, you know, this is not, you know, th th this is just the facts of the impacts of when you do this is a cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Back to those bridges are not designed for that. And furthermore, the roads were not designed for that weight. Uh, so I think their their notion is if we can put more weight on the truck, then we'll make a fewer trips. But you've seen you've seen in previous meetings from planning on the freight that our freight volumes are continuing to grow. And the other tricky part, as Meg said, was ag, the things that have exemptions today at 84,000 pounds only constitute about 25% of all the trucks. Mm -hmm. 
This goes to 90,000 pounds for 100% of the trucks. So there's going to be a lot more wear and tear on the roadways because now you've got 75% more trucks weighing more driving across the county roads, city streets, and state highways. But not on the interstates. Let's be clear. This mm -hmm. does not apply to interstates. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's, that's the notion. And, I mean, it's well-intentioned. I mean, it is a well-intentioned, hey, you know, we're struggling. You know, everybody, er, as far as I know, everybody's struggling with labor right now. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, if we can, you know, cut a driver out or whatever, then it's profitable. But the, the flip side of that is now you're going to have to drive further. Yep. And the further means less money. And as we, uh, the forest products, uh, UGA did a study just a few years ago about Georgia's forest products. Uh, they average about 3.1 trips from the forest to the mill a day, uh, according to that UGA study. Um, and so now if you've got to drive 30 miles more, it may cut a trip out, which is the opposite of helping business. It may be hindering business, uh, or, or you just have to haul at the current, you know, loads, uh, or less the, at eighty four thousand pounds, you, you know, then you don't, then you can haul, but then you're, there's no, there's no reason for the bill at that point if you just have to haul at eighty four thousand. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Okay. I think your name. Yes. Well, I think, uh, yeah. Thank you, Chairman. I think Chairman Murray expressed a lot of what I was going to point out. When you get into the real world, as you know, I've being in the legislature at the time I was in it, I met in a different capacity over the, the subject. And I know when being a legislator, you know, we're here in this room, we're talking about road construction and cost. And, 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 and that's what we have to focus on in the legislature. We got a little bigger scope uh, to look at and from a commissioner mentioned about economic development and the pressures that are on the uh, uh, industries in the state. Forestry is, Mr. pointed out, being the biggest, and and he is correct in the cost. Labor, not having labor is a whole nother situation, but the insurance, labor will hinder your business. <clears throat> insurance will put you out of business, and most of it is not getting it. Uh, and if you really would talk to a to an operator off the record, they're going to tell you they want less citations <laughs> because with less citations, they're going to have less insurance cancellations. Uh, they're not only having citations because of weight, they have citations because of the difficulty of the quality of drivers that they're getting. Uh, and they have been under pressure from time to time based on events. I know, and it wasn't just the loggers, but when that horrific accident happened on 16 involving the nurses, there was a, a, a marked increase from public safety, you know, in trying to deal with some things and it got so, so hard mm -hmm that the operators were just having a really, when I say operators, uh, the, the loggers were having a really difficult time uh, with the, and it wasn't just weight limits, it was a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So if you really get right down to it, I think maybe I could be just maybe a little bit less judicious because I've been in it. The commissioner was a lot more polite with, they want to be ticketed less yeah. and have less issues with their insurance carriers and pay less in insurance premiums and keep insurance premiums because I've, there are two different operations near my home that, that ceased to exist not because of profitability, which was strained already, was because their insurance carrier would not re up their insurance. So they just, they just shut down. So that's what it, it, it really gets down to. I don't have the answer for it. I'll say this. When I got to the legislature, there's some subjects that are still being discussed, you know, and one of them was truck weights, and that was in 1999. So yeah. if you think this is a new subject, it's not. Uh, but that's, but the commissioner had a, a lot more articulate way of saying it, but that they have a hard time with the citations and the insurance I see. with their weight fluctuations. Some of it, they just, I know what happens. I say, just go with it. <laughs> we'll take a chance. Mm -hmm. Kind of like when you put that uh, speed 
uh, on, you know, 85 trying to get to Atlanta on time. I'll take a chance. Yeah. Uh, that's what they do. I'm saying they should. Okay. And that's what the, the crux of it all is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I just curious if Commissioner or Meg or Josh, if y'all had any instinct or feeling of how this bill may turn out this session. <laughs> I'll defer to someone else. <laughs> the mission called the church somebody. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. He said whoever you gets the most that. votes will win. That's why you don't leave at eleven thirty on Sunny Die. Because these things have ways showing up on all kind of other bills. <laughs> yeah. so, so you don't have a, a, a thought of which way that it may go. Hopes to vote in the committee. I think jo Josh said uh, in his presentation that the, it passed the Transportation Committee 18 to 11, as I recall. Uh, it has yet to go to the floor of the House. Um, so we would anticipate that sometime, early, potentially next week, would be our guess. Uh, so uh, then from there, obviously, if, if, if it depends on what happens there, it depends on which way it goes. So. Hard to know. Jeff, thanks for that easy question. We'll, we'll defer to your expert opinion on that answer. <laughs> yeah. We'll make some phone calls. Uh, Man, a further question. I, I have uh, one last question. Yes. You, you mentioned a lot of these bridges are older bridges and designed for a lot lower weights. The, the same bridge, type of bridges, um, what, what do you design weights to now? one that we've got 2% of. So our current standard is designed for the 100,000 pounds and a 75 year life. So that, that's what we designed to. There's nothing that requires cities and counties to design to that because you're gonna pay a lot more for that bridge than you are for uh, what is the HS20 or there's actually a HS20S now. Um, so, you know, so it's up to the cities and counties design on there when they do their bridges, they can design it for everything. And I and I don't know how many of them actually designed to HL ninety three. it's probably small. Yeah, I would imagine so. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Got more questions, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>